Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, howdy. Howdy. It's good to see you guys. It's good to be uh, back here. My wife Donna and I uh, love coming back. It's, we feel like it's been a while. Uh, we've been busy um, having babies. Uh, so we've got a three-year-old and a two-year-old and a four-month-old. So yeah, so we are um, just so uh, tired, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, blessed. And, uh, and it's always fun to, to load up the van and come down here and be with you guys. So uh, whether you're here in Klein, Woodlands, online, just know we're thrilled to be here with you uh, today. So if you've got a Bible, we're in Luke chapter 7. And uh, let me read to you a couple verses. I'm going to start in verse 36. If you don't have a Bible, there's ushers coming that, that would love to give you one. Uh, but I'm going to read to you uh, Luke chapter 7, starting verse 36. We'll pray and then jump into the text this morning. Uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 36 <clears throat> says this. Speaking of Jesus, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to him, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you've judged rightly. And then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. but She's wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let me pray for us. Well, Father, I want to thank you. Just even reading that text and watching the video, I just, it makes me think of the, the statement here at Faithbridge that it's real people living real life and... In the midst of that, God, real life, I know sometimes we want to kind of shine up what we look like when we come into places like this, but the truth is we're very real people, and in the midst of our real lives, there's there's real beauty, and then there's real, really broken and sad things, Uh, and some of them are things that are happening to us, and some are things that we've done that are things that we carry with us that we wish were different, and I just want to thank you, God, that wherever we are at this moment, Lord, however near to you we feel or far from you we feel, however excited we are to be in venues like this or however excited we are to get out of here because we're uncomfortable in this space, I just want to thank you, God, that you've brought us into this moment to look at your son because in seeing him, we see what you're like, and in seeing that, we see what you're like with us in our best and in our worst. And I just pray, God, you would open our eyes this morning to see what it's like when a holy God touches down on a very unholy and a very dirty people uh, like us. And so I want to invite you all, if you're willing, take a minute and pray and ask him. Say, Lord, please teach me something today. (laughs) And then if you would, please pray for me that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you, and we trust you. Use this time, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, not long after college, I I visited Italy with my little sister, 
and we went to the Uffizi, one of the many art galleries in Italy, one of the ones that contains some of the most priceless works of art in all of Italy. But in that moment, by the time I got to that one, I was like, I would imagine many of you in here, uh, I was not necessarily a connoisseur of Renaissance art. And so uh, I showed up at these art galleries and wanted to, you know, sort of take in each piece of priceless art and appreciate them. But by your third uh, museum, it just, you don't even know what to do in front of them anymore. So by the time we got to the Uffizi, we were just speed walking through it, right? And we were like, I know it's terrible, but okay. And on we go. And we're like, it's all the same. There's Virgin Mary, Virgin Mary, Virgin Mary, baby Jesus, naked guy. Okay, next room. And we're just kind of walking through this place, just kind of there to say we were there. Uh, and I remember we are just zooming down this hallway. And yet at one moment, I turned the corner and was arrested. I mean, completely stopped in my tracks by a painting. And that had never happened to me in life before. And I don't know if it's happened since. Like, I've been amazed by nature, but I've never had a painting completely captivate me. And it was one done by Michelangelo, and it was of... Mary and baby Jesus, but it was totally different. They, they were in a more natural setting, not a formal one. It looked very real. And it looked so real, like 3D, like you could talk to them. You're like, they look like us. And yet he had done something that broke from the norm of all these other paintings. He had used vibrant colors. So at once it looked very earthy like us, but then almost surreal. And I was just transported by this thing. And so literally all these different tours with their little tour guys would come, talk, leave, come, talk, leave. And I was stuck there. And after several minutes, the people I was with came back and were like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm going to be a minute. And then at the end of it, uh, I went to the gift shop and bought every single little card, knickknack, keychain with the picture on it because I was absolutely mesmerized by this portrait of Jesus. Now, why mention that? Because I remember the first time I ever heard this text taught it was Tommy Nelson, and I remember hearing him teach it, and I had the same experience of being completely captivated by it and changed by it. And I still feel that way when I read it. And, and you know, I want to present it to us today, because here's the thing. I think sometimes what we need is not another argument. Sometimes what we need in moments like this is, is a picture of what is and what could be and be transported and changed by that. And so I'm not going to come at you and preach at you a lot this morning. I just want to show you Jesus and what he's like when he deals with people in their worst of moments. And so in John chapter 7, verse 36, the setting we're given in verse 36, it says, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, in those days in the Jewish community, the Pharisees held a lot of political sway because they were a powerful religious party. They were sort of the preservers of religious and moral purity in the culture. The name Pharisee means separated one. Now, we're not told why this Pharisee particularly asked Jesus to come over for dinner uh, at this moment. Luke doesn't tell us. But what we are pretty sure of as you read the text is it wasn't because this Pharisee felt his deep need for a savior. And you see it in the way he treats Jesus as he walks in. It's pretty clear he doesn't feel the need because the Pharisee's treatment of Jesus is discourteous by the standards of the day. It was typical if you held a banquet in the honor of a special guest. When they came into the house, you would pour oil on their head as a sign of respect. And so when Jesus shows up at the house, Simon the Pharisee offers no oil. It was customary when a friend would come into your house that you would kiss them as a sign of friendship and greeting. That still happens in many countries today. But when Jesus comes to the house, Simon offers him no kiss of peace. And it was common courtesy back then that as you walked the dusty roads of Jerusalem and uh, Israel, that you would get dirt on your sandals. When you came into a home, you wouldn't wear those shoes into the house. You would take them off. And so it was basic hospitality, politeness, to offer people water to wash their feet. And Simon offers Jesus no water. So in doing that, he's making a statement. He's saying, I'll, I'll bring you into my house to evaluate you, but I want to make it real clear you're not an authority in my life and you're not a friend. And so he withholds from Jesus the respect, the friendship, even the courtesy standard of the day. And then in the next verse, you get a woman who comes in who is in every way his opposite. And in verse 37, it says, and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment. Luke 
chronicles her arrival by saying, behold, a woman of the city, a sinner. He says, behold, because you go, something's happening here that's not normal. Why did this woman just come in? And yet I want to make clear, the behold, the shock, the hey, look at that, is not the fact that she entered the Pharisee's house. She's not breaking and entering. Some of you go, what's she doing? Is it she's walked into the house? Well, no. You get a clue as to what's going on here when twice Luke says they were reclining at table. What he means by that is it was a low table, about a coffee table height, where you would kind of lean in on your arm to eat and your feet would extend behind you. That wasn't a normal way to eat back then. You would sit at a normal table, but when you had special banquets, you'd recline at table. And so by saying they're reclining at table, you go, this is a special banquet, which wasn't totally uncommon back then. When there was a guest rabbi, a guest teacher coming to town, the local hometown rabbi could invite them over to evaluate them. And when they would do that, to have them over at dinner at their house, it was like two celebrities meeting. I mean, it had some educational value, sure, but it had entertainment value. I mean, it's like watching uh, some of your favorite directors and the special features on a movie, like talking to each other, you know, or going to a conference and you see people in a round table discussion. You want in on that. And so when they had meals like this, you would leave the door open so people could come in and sit along the floor, uh, along the wall of your house or lean in through the open windows. So they're not part of the meal, but you can kind of sit in and be quiet and partake of it, right? So it's not weird that she walked into the house. She's not breaking and entering. What's weird is not that a woman's in the house. What's weird is that a woman like this just came into the house. Behold, a woman of the city who's a sinner. And let me just stop there and say, some of you, you maybe feel like that when you come to places like this. What is a person like that doing in a place like this? I mean, some of you maybe feel that. You're like, if these people only knew. Maybe you walked in the door and were like, behold, a sinner walks into Faith Bridge. You know, it's kind of how you feel. of going, I'm not like these people. These people don't know me. And if these people knew my life, they wouldn't let me in here. And I don't really want to be here among them either. Some of you feel that tension of behold, one of these things is not like the other. That's how you feel. I remember I was at a wedding one time and a guy was asked to be the scripture reader. And he got up there and, and he kind of read the verses. And when he came down, he went, whew. He said, I thought I was going to burst into flames up there. He's like, I'm the last guy they should have touching a Bible, right? Because he knew he was living a crazy life. And the fact that he was in a church was making him uncomfortable, right? I got to get out of here because there's someone like me wouldn't be welcome in a place like this is the assumption. And so behold, a woman of the city comes in and she's a sinner. Now, a natural question at that moment is, okay, what'd she do? And Luke doesn't tell us. But what he wants to make clear to us is she has a bad reputation. She's a woman in the city, and, and they know what kind of woman she is. Now, that term sinner, uh, it could mean a lot of things, but it often had a sexual connotation. So some people, when they comment on this, say she's a prostitute. But there's nothing in there that says that she's selling her body for money. But there's often a sexual connotation. So she couldn't have been a prostitute, but she might have been promiscuous. She might have been someone who, who had been with a lot of different men. Uh, we don't know. What we do know is that she hadn't lived a pure life. And all of us have some things in us that we go, man, I don't want these people to know. If these people knew this about me, what would they say? They would reject me. Her story is they knew. They all knew. And so she walks into a place like that and she is reminded, and not just a place like that, she's reminded in the marketplace and in the town square by the way the people look at her of her own condemnation. And yet somewhere, and we don't know where, in the midst of this life of hers, she hears the message of Jesus. Maybe she was in the crowd from earlier in Luke that heard Jesus talk about the righteousness of God and the need for repentance, and she got to that place of going, you don't have to tell me there's something wrong with me. I know I'm broken. I look in the mirror and don't love what I see. Some of us don't need to be beaten up by the condemnation of our sins. We do our, quite a good job by ourselves, thank you very much. And so maybe she's feeling that, and she shows up to his last sermon where he starts talking about that even the most broken and desperate and dirty of us can be made clean and whole by the grace of God available in the person of Jesus. And she starts hearing that there's a possibility for even as someone as dirty as her to be welcomed by God, not just tolerated by God, but loved and adopted by God. And she starts hearing the message of Jesus and it lights fire in something in her soul that had gone out a long time ago, and that is hope. And so like many times, when someone speaks in a crowd, you can't get near them. 
And so Jesus gives the sermon. She hears it and something changes in her little heart. It becomes alive with belief that God wants even me. And yet she can't get close to him. So she hears he's at the Pharisee's house of all houses. (laughs) But she didn't care. She musters up whatever little courage she has. And she comes walking into that house, clutching her little bottle of perfume. And then Luke slows down the narrative and gives us seven verbs in one sentence. Try shoving seven verbs into one sentence. Seven verbs into one sentence of what she does. Interestingly, we never hear her say a word. Her actions speak for her. And it says, standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head, kissed his feet, and anointed them with oil. How, how is she standing behind him at his feet while he's reclining at table, so she's, he's here. And this picture is, she walks up close to him. She heard the message, heard the sermon, I wanna to talk to this guy, but like happens to many people, when she gets close to him, being close to someone who had had that kind of impact on your life, who knows if she had a speech prepared? What we do know is that when she saw him, she just starts crying. Now I know for a fact this happens to people, I, I know it happens all the time to Beth Moore. that women who've been so touched by her ministry and her teaching and her life go down front in different moments, but when they get to the point where they're in front of Beth and Beth's actually making eye contact with them, not in a crowd of, I think she just looked at me, but like she's standing, I'm alone in front of her looking at me. Often people come up with a plan of what to say, but they just start crying and Beth just hugs them, right? And this woman gets to Jesus. Who knows if she had a speech prepared, but when she sees his face, when she gets close enough to see the detail of his hands, and the dirt on his feet, she just starts crying. And she hits her knees and she lets those tears, Luke uses the word for rain. She's not just a little choked up. She lets them rain on those dirty feet. And then she does something that was considered immodest in that day. She unbinds her hair. Women would keep their hair bound up and put back. Uh, It was a great delight for the man when you got married that the woman would let down her hair. Uh, Paul called it the glory of a woman, her hair let down. And so this woman in front of all these people lets her hair down. And she takes the glory of woman and she uses it as a rag for his feet. And then she begins to kiss those same feet and anoints them with perfume. She's a picture of Romans 6 where Paul tells us, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And so this woman who had painted up eyes to attract men, bound up hair to attract men, put on perfume to attract men, now uses those same eyes to weep and clean his feet, that same hair to wash the water off, and that same perfume to pour it out on the feet of her hero. And the whole room is filled with the beauty of that fragrance. But then, and I love the way Tommy Nelson said it, he says, and then a stench arose. And it's the attitude of this man. And you see in verse 39, it says, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, and the assumption now is that he is not, He would have known who and what sort of woman that is who's touching him, for she's a sinner. He's been evaluating Jesus, and internally, he comes to a decision. If this guy were a prophet, which clearly now he isn't, he would have had the power to discern what kind of woman this is, because we all local folks know, and he would have figured out who she is, and he wouldn't let this whole scenario play out of her touching him. And he uses the present tense. She's continuing to touch him. And so you see that this guy's offended, not just by this woman, but he's offended by Jesus, who would entertain the presence of a girl like that. And the great irony of it is, in verse 40, it says Jesus answering him. Now, I don't know if you caught that in the text. It says, now when the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself. He has an internal dialogue saying, this man clearly can't be a prophet. And Jesus answers that, the internal questioning, thereby proving he has the very prophetic powers that this man suggests he does not. And Jesus answers the critiques in this man's heart. And he does it with a simple story. He says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he says, say it, teacher. And he says, a certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. 
When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of them both. That word cancels, were freely forgive. They did not have anything with which to pay. Both debtors, both owe, both powerless to pay, both radically forgiven. And then he looks at him and says, now which one will love him more? Which one? The one who was forgiven two months of debt or the one forgiven two years of debt, basically? Which one? And Simon answers him, the one I suppose, I love that he's just not even willing to humble himself enough to give the obvious answer to the story. Well, I guess. (laughs) The one who was forgiven more. And Jesus says, you've judged rightly. And then Jesus tells the religious teacher to look at this sinful woman. He says, do you see this woman? And he begins to go down the list of courtesies that Simon neglected and this woman far surpassed. He says, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She's wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil. She has anointed my feet with ointment. What Jesus is saying is, yes, Simon, I know exactly what kind of woman this is. And frankly, son, you could learn a few things from her. Because here's the deal, Simon, your heart is cold to me because you don't think you're that bad. This woman has felt the weight of her sin. And so she knows the value of a savior. And that's why Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but whoever's forgiven little, loves little. Now, let me clarify some things. What's he not saying? He's not saying she's forgiven because she loved much. Because she did this, now she's forgiven. He's not saying that. That would go against the whole story and all of New Testament theology. What happened in the story? Debtor, cannot pay, freely forgiven. And it's that combination of desperation and freely given grace that produces love in the story, right? Who will love more? The one who understands they've been forgiven more. It's the forgiveness that creates the love. And so Jesus says, look at her. Do you see this display of love? This love does not create forgiveness. It displays that it's there. That's how you get a great love for God. Love displays the proof of forgiveness embraced. It's the forgiveness that creates the love in the debtor, not the other way around. When you know how bad you are and know how great his grace is, that produces in you love. That's how it works, right? And so Jesus looks and says, her sins, which are many. Now, why does he throw that in there? I always thought that was a, like, a, like a shot at her at the end. Her sins, which are many. Why does he say that? I think he says that because I think sometimes in contexts like this, we're willing to confess certain sins, right? Confess your sins. Not, okay, yeah, I did this. Yeah, I exaggerated that story. Yeah, I do that. Yeah, I said that. I shouldn't have said that to that person. Okay, that. But then there's some other ones that we reserve for not this moment. I think Jesus is letting her know, I, I'm aware of them. I think maybe if there was any voice in her that says, maybe he's just forgiving me because he generally likes to forgive general people. That this is her way of saying, no, I know exactly who you are. It's not like I'm saying, you're forgiven. And then a disciple whispers, she's a lady that was doing that thing the other night. Oh, oh uh, whoops. Um, maybe not you, because that was crazy. Um, <laughs> no, he says, I know all of it. I know all of it. I know the stuff from the college years. I know the stuff from last weekend. I know the things you've saw late at night. I know it all. I see it all. I understand it all. Don't don't tell me I don't know how deep the saying goes. I am very aware of how many we're talking about here. And yet the pronouncement stays the same. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. And it's that understanding of my desperation and his grace that explodes into love for people. It's the opposite direction of most religious presentations in the world by anyone but Jesus. How does the rest of it go? You serve God hoping one day he'll forgive you. I remember sitting with an elderly woman once as she was on her way to death and I said, do you have peace with God? Do you know that you'll be welcomed into his presence when you die? And she said, I hope I've done enough. 
What's the assumption there? I got to hustle to get forgiveness. That's not the gospel. Two debtors, unable to pay, freely forgiven, produces love. What's the Christian motivation for humble, courageous service? Why do we do the kinds of things that are on that video? Is it to earn the smile of God? That's the critique many people say. Y'all are just trying to make yourselves be good people. No, it's the recognition of where we've come from. Why does my dog not run away? I left the gate open again yesterday. She never leaves. Why? Because Donna called me from a camp where someone had just abandoned her out in the woods. Starved, obviously abused dog. Starved, abused, discarded dog. My wife takes into our home. And so for the first few months in our home, all the implications of being starved and abused and traumatized were still there in her. It took her months to realize, no, these people actually aren't going to get rid of me. No, these people actually have seen my best and worst and the mess I'll make, and they still feed me. And when she understood that even in her most broken of moments, we drew her in, that has produced in her loyalty. She doesn't do that to try to say, hey, I cleaned up the yard the other day. Hey, I'm working for you. I'm hustling, boss. She's not like that. We loved her, and that's produced love in her. That's the gospel. Why does the Christian serve? Why do we mow someone else's yard when we don't even like mowing ours? <laughs> it's not to earn the smile of God. It's because we have it. It's because we know what we were, and we know what he did for us. And it is nothing for us to pour out all we have at the feet of a hero like that. Francis Thompson was an incredible mind. He wrote The Hound of Heaven, which some of you may have read or not, about the relentless pursuit of God, but he lived a very turbulent life, particularly as a young man. He had a very conflict-filled, chaotic home, and he left it and lived on the streets of London. And he developed a, a, a rhythm in London. He would go to the Charing Cross district and use opium all day. And then he would crawl over to the River Thames to sleep on the banks of the river at night as a homeless man. And Francis Thompson did this with all his genius. I mean, periodically he would pick up a paper in London and he would write a response along the edge to some of the articles and turn it in. And the editor of the paper in London said, one as great as Milton is among us, but he will not leave a return address. This guy was so much talent, so much ability, squandering it all on homelessness and opium and drugs, sleeping along the banks of the river, friendless and hopeless. And yet, the scripture that had been read into his life as a young man came to mind one night, particularly the story of Jacob. Jacob in the Old Testament, who at one moment could not have been lower, rejected by family, friends, alone in the desert with a rock for a pillow. At his lowest, the heavens open. And God brings down a ladder to Jacob. Even you at your lowest, I see you and I'm coming for you. And Francis S. Thompson thought about that, thought about the fact that even me, after wrecking my life, even me, after the mess I've made, God would come after me. He had an absolute transformation in that moment. And like many of us, when you see how desperate you are and then feel the power of his grace, you become a worshiper. And he wrote this to his friends. But when so sad thou canst not, canst not sadder, cry, and upon thy so sore loss shall shine the traffic of Jacob's ladder, pitched between heaven and Charing Cross. Yea, in the night, my soul, my daughter, cry, clinging to heaven by the hems, and lo, Christ will walk upon the water, not of Gennesaret, but Thames that even in my lowest and most broken of places, Christ comes to me there. And when you understand that, it explodes into love. It explodes into worship. It explodes into service. Forgiveness produces love in the heart of this sweet woman, right? Now, some of us read this and you go, Ben, that is so beautiful. That's so great. Whoever's been forgiven much will love much. Here's the problem, Ben. I didn't live a crazy life. And some of you that grew up in church, you hate this story because you go, I went to Sunday school and I, you know, memorized Bible verses and shoot, 
I guess I'm destined to never love him much because I didn't have to be forgiven of much. And maybe as you were a kid, you were just so ashamed of your testimony because the good testimonies, the one that make it into big church are the ones when they were like, I was on opium and I was killing all kinds of people. And then now I'm a missionary and everyone goes, yeah. And you're like, man, I've been in Sunday school. Darn Awanas just kept me off the stage. And you're just like, oh, I guess I'm doomed to not love God much because I didn't live crazy. Let me tell you something. That is not what Jesus is saying. He's not putting a premium on sin. See, the Pharisee's problem is not that he didn't sin enough. Jesus is going to condemn his pride more than the sins of what this woman did on the streets. You can be more lost in the pews than, than, than out there on the streets with this woman. You can, right? Pride is ugly. It's not the amount of sin committed. It's the amount of sin realized, understood. And so for many of you, you would say, Ben, I've been going to church for years. I'm a Christian, all that kind of stuff. Maybe you don't feel this kind of love for God that propels you to invite people to church to see the God you found, to serve those who are in need in our city for the glory of God and their good. You don't feel that explosive love in you that prompts you to serve. You go, why? Well, I would say if you're not feeling that, it's because you're probably missing one of these two elements that produces it. It's the combination of two chemicals, right? My depravity and his grace, his forgiveness. My guess is you're minimizing one of those two. If you're not feeling a great love for Jesus and a great motivation to serve in his name, one of it might be is that you just minimize your sin. You minimize it. Right? You minimize how bad it really is. There's always an excuse. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but you don't understand. Day after day, that guy keeps saying that. So I was just telling him what everybody was saying, and you, just, you got an excuse ready for what you said. Well, look, I didn't want to snap at him like that, but you need to understand the way they are always coming at me, like you just, you got it. Yeah, okay, maybe I shouldn't have watched those kind of things. But you don't understand, I had a hard day at work. And you just kind of come up with, well, if she had them, well, if they had them, well, if those Christians hadn't been so judgmental, there's always someone to blame. There's always a place to shuffle off an excuse. There's always a way to justify and protect your sin. There's no protecting, no justifying, no explaining in this woman, just confessing. And some of us, we're willing to confess the light and cute sins here, but not the really dark, sad ones, not the really ugly ones. This woman has no shame left, presents it all. But it's at that level of honesty that the grace of God comes in so powerfully. And others of you, you may say, well, Ben, I don't feel that great love for God, but I know I'm a sinner, thank you. Every night my mind recalls what a loser I am. You're not minimizing your sin, you're minimizing forgiveness. And I don't know if you're one of those people that you go, well, he couldn't possibly forgive me. He couldn't forgive what I've done. You don't know what I did. You don't know what I said. You don't know what I did as a kid. You don't know what I did now. You don't know how I wrecked my marriage or marriages. You don't know how I've wrecked my kids and now it's too late to reconcile. You don't know the mess I've made. God cannot forgive someone like me. And let me tell you something. Do not insult the grace of your maker. He understands what you are. He knows your sins, which are many. But don't, out of a false humility, try to denigrate the powerful love of God. That's not worship. That's not honorable. That's, it's, uh, it's keeping from yourself what he's come to give. It's when I am honest about my sin and honest about his grace that he'll take Paul, the apostle Paul, who was a religious zealot murdering people for his faith. He's a terrorist. And he'll make him the writer of the, the epistles, the New Testament. I don't know how many of you are terrorists. But if God can take a Paul and make him an apostle, he can make a you and make you a worshiper. It's actually to his glory to save even you whose sins are many. So he pronounces over this woman, your sins are forgiven. But yet when he does that, it confuses some people at the table. They say, who's this that forgives sin? Because if they were astute, they were following along in the story. They were like, wait a second. In the story, money lender, people who owed money, he forgives them, they love him. And Jesus' application of it, she was a sinner against God. God's forgiven her. She loves Jesus. 
No, Jesus presents himself as the recipient of the love that should have gone back to the money lender. So is Jesus putting himself on equal footing with God? He surely can't be saying that. Maybe he just lost track of the narrative. Maybe he got a little excited. But then Jesus puts it out there. He looks at her and says, your sins are forgiven. I'm not confused about who I am. I am putting myself in the position of the forgiver. And it throws off the people in the store. You can't say that. If I came to you and let's say you robbed that guy and I came up and y'all are fighting over it, you robbed my house, I saw you do it. And I came in and was like, Shh, hey, 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 I forgive him. I forgive you. You'd be like, uh, you're not really in this, bro. <laughs> For Jesus to step into the things she's done and to say, I forgive you, they ask the natural question, who's this guy think he is? But he doesn't answer them. He looks at her and says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And you go, where does this guy get off telling a woman like that she's really forgiven? How can he do that? Let me tell you how he can do that. How does he know her debts are forgiven? Because he's the payment. Because he's the payment. He said, man, I didn't come here to give pep talks. I didn't come here to try to clean up your act. Whenever a debt is incurred, somebody's got to pay. Like if I loaned you my iPhone, if you're like, can I borrow your phone? And then you just dropped it in the toilet. We're like, oh, I got two options. I can look at you and say, that'll be 200 bucks and you pay. Or I can say, don't worry about it, man. I got this. But guess what? That doesn't make the iPhone come back. And like, look, it forget, right? Like uh, it's, it's still, we're still down an iPhone. So if I forgive you, I'm eating the cost, right? That's how you get forgiven is because I pay, right? And so Jesus looks and says, you're forgiven. How do you know that? Because he's about to be the payment. I will know no sin, but I will become sin so that you might become the righteousness of God. It's when we see that that he says, I know everything you've done. And I'm going to take all the guilt of it and all the shame of it and all the condemnation of it and I will bear it and I will bury it and then I will rise and beat death and you ride with me. And when you trust me, you're saved from it. So don't wallow in that which I came to set you free from. You're forgiven because of what I've done. Your debts are gone. Why? Because I'm the payment. And when you understand that's who Jesus is, that will produce in you a loyal love. I promise you. In World War II, the men of the 101st would lay down their lives for Colonel Winters in a heartbeat. They loved him. Why? Because in a fierce battle when they were pinned down, he realized to stay here in this foxhole means death, and he called his men to go forward, but he could tell they were afraid, so he went by himself. And he attacked uh, the Germans on his own. And when they saw this man willing to lay down his life for us, it produced in them loyalty. If he would risk his life for our lives, we will follow him anywhere. Jesus gave his life for us. So the Christians would say, that man went running face first into condemnation and he took it for me. I will go anywhere for him. That's the Christian life. The sweetness of forgiveness produces loyal love. Let me pray for us. Well, Father, I wanna thank you that Lord, you know what we are. You know the best things about us and the ugliest things about us. You know the things we've confessed and you know the things that we've kept with us because we said, I'll carry this to my grave. But you don't want that. What would happen if it was all exposed? What would happen? What kind of condemnation would we feel? Some of us need to own that and maybe you just need to whisper it even now to him what it is you've done. No excuses, no justifying, no minimizing, saying, I do this, I've done this, I am in this even now. And you let your sin stand at its full height, and then you let the flood of grace come washing in to wipe it away. Because that's what Jesus came to do. Behold, a woman of the city, a sinner, I know what you are, your sins are many but you are forgiven. You are forgiven because your faith saves you. And so if you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ to be a savior and a forgiver, you can do that even now and say, I want in. I want in. I want your forgiveness and my faith to produce love in my soul for you. 
And Lord, for those of us who know you as Christians, we still gather sin like sediment. May we not minimize, justify, and harden up our souls like Simon. May we continuously land at your feet, receiving grace and worshiping you. Because what our neighbors, our friends, our family need more than anything is not to see how put together we are, but to see how much we're not. And yet God will take even us and make us servants. And the world is filled with the beauty of the fragrance of people who are at the feet of their rescuing king. Let that be our story, God, for your glory and our good. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I am joined by Ben Stewart who just gave an awesome sermon on Luke 7. And uh, Ben, thank you so much for being here with us today. Really appreciate yeah. you being here. Be um, I want to start off with a couple just real quick, uh, quick questions based on the, the contents of your sermon. Yeah. Um, the first one was you gave a, um, a really nice illustration at the end of this man who was a drug addict who was kind of sleeping by the river right. uh, Thames and then uh, Quickly, could you go over who that person is again? Yeah, Francis Thompson. Okay. Uh, he wrote uh, The Hound of Heaven. What I quoted was not The Hound of Heaven, but he wrote that. That's probably his most famous piece. Gotcha. And uh, I intersected with him through a book Robbie Zacharias wrote, Can Man Live Without God? Okay. Is how I found out about him. So. Great. So that's us. Yeah. Francis Thompson. Great stuff. Francis, Francis Thompson. Thompson. Yeah. And uh, another quick question um, someone wrote in was asking if the anointing of Jesus in the book of Luke, Luke is the same anointing that he received uh, at Bethany that was mentioned in the book of Mark. Yeah, that's actually a common question because it shows up in Mark and John and, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, Matthew. So, uh, and there's things that are similar about it. Right. Jesus is anointed. He's at the house of a person named Simon. Right. It's a woman anointing him. But they diverge pretty pretty powerfully from there, that this right. one's clearly at uh, Simon the Pharisee's house. This mm -hmm. one was at Simon the leper's house, which lepers can't be Pharisees. Right. One's at the beginning of his ministry, one's at the end. Um, and you go, well, Luke's roughly chronological. How do you know that? Well, mm -hmm. this one, the emphasis is about the forgiveness of this woman who was known t for being a sinner. Okay. This one is about uh, Mary, mm -hmm. and Jesus will say, this is about my burial. Right. Uh, and, uh, and so there's enough differences in what's happening in those two that you go, these are different moments. These right. are totally different moments. The Luke one, the Pharisees didn't want to murder him yet. They didn't like him, but right. it, it moved from, I don't like you to, I want to kill you okay. about midway point in this ministry. So, so they're two different moments, uh, but that's a great question. Great. Thanks so much for clarifying that. I really appreciate that. And so, um, let me ask you this question. So you highlighted in your sermon how, um, this woman who, um, her sins were many, um, came before Jesus completely vulnerable, completely humble, completely broken. Um, and then Jesus says, uh, your faith has saved you. Your sins are forgiven. In that moment, is Jesus forgiving her sins right then? Or is he simply announcing something that he's recognizing in her, that her sins are indeed forgiven? Yeah, I would say he's announcing it based right. on the flow of the whole story. Right. I mean, if you follow, he chose that parable he told mm -hmm. to help describe the moment of what's happening. Right. And you go, what, what was the order in the parable? It was debtor cannot pay, mm -hmm. debtor forgiven, right. forgiveness produces great love. Right. And then he looks at this woman and says, do you see these things she's doing? Mm -hmm. They demonstrate great love. Therefore, I say to you, her sins are forgiven. Right. So he was not putting it after, then that story would make no sense. Mm -hmm. What he's saying is, what we're seeing right now is evidence right. of forgiveness received. So when he looks at her, what he gives her is assurance, mm -hmm. which is the last piece. Right. You know? So if we're looking at our own life, you go, what comes first? Jesus' announcement of forgiveness offered. Okay. We receive it by faith. Mm -hmm. When you receive it by faith, it produces love in the human heart. That love motivates action. Mm -hmm. And that action, Jesus sees and says, love is there because faith was there, that forgiveness was there. Right. It's kind of like a tree. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, if the soil is the forgiveness of God, her seed is faith, okay. right? 
The tree is love. Right. The fruit is her actions. Okay. And yeah. Jesus is going, I see fruit because this is a tree because there's a soil. Done. He's just taking it back down. That right. Makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes perfect so, sense. Yeah. It's and a so great I, question. And actually, there's a follow-up question about that assurance piece. Uh, someone was wondering, you know, let's say that they have repented and they've asked for forgiveness um, and they've also asked um, uh, for Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. But then after that happens, they end up falling back into that same sin and it just kind of becomes this cycle of falling into the same sin over and over and over again. And so th um, their question was, uh, how can they be sure um, that they are indeed, that they do indeed belong to Christ, even though they keep falling into that same sin pattern over and over again. Yeah. Well, I would say um, <clears throat> you have to go back and say, what is my salvation based on? Mm -hmm. It is based entirely on the work of Jesus. Right. You know, so again, go back into this story. Mm -hmm. How is the debt forgiven? Not by anything the debtor does right. in his story graciously forgiven by the money lender. That's how you know, how am I saved? His gracious work on my behalf right. and my reception of it. So you keep going back to that. Forgiveness is by the work of Jesus alone. Okay. And so you go, if I keep struggling with it, I have to believe what he says. If we confess our sins, mm -hmm. he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sin right. and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And yet, you go, what if I keep struggling with it? I would say, does he forgive you? Yes. Right. But we are meant to repent. Mm -hmm. One of the fruits of forgiveness is a changed life. Right. And so you have to ask yourself, um, have I repented? Or do right. I just know, ah, I know he'll forgive me, and then I can just keep rolling along my merry way. Right. That cheapening of grace mm -hmm. shows that you never understood your sin in the first place. Right. You're missing that piece of I believe I'm really this bad mm -hmm. and I believe I need to be saved. So I would go back to, do you even understand how deep the stain goes? Right. But then I would also point you to James. James says, confess your sins one to another mm -hmm. and pray for one another that you may be healed. Right. And that's where I see a lot of people is they'll struggle with a sin, want it out of their life. Mm -hmm. They ask God for forgiveness, right. but they keep doing it. Right. And, uh, and it steals their assurance because mm -hmm. they don't see the fruit, so there's no assurance. Right. And they go, so am I not saved? You go, well, you have no assurance mm -hmm. of your salvation because you're not seeing outworking. God has given you a sanctifying tool called us. Right. You confess your sins one to another. Mm -hmm. So I, I meet with a lot of guys that struggle with pornography. Right. And as long as they keep it in the dark, they'll just keep doing it. Yeah. But when you tell them, you have to confess it to me, Right. and you repent it with me, mm -hmm. not to get forgiveness, but to change, right. that, that begins to get it out of their life. Right. And their assurance rises yeah. that they really were forgiven back then because now they're seeing it work out in their life. But don't neglect the grace God has given his children, namely the body of Christ. Right. And so that's where I said repentance, sanctification, it's a team sport. Absolutely. So if you're struggling over and over again with the same sin, it might be because you're struggling with it in the dark mm -hmm. and uh, we're only as sick as our secrets. So you need to confess to us. Absolutely. Well, and that also helps uh, too with people who maybe are blind to certain sins that they have in their lives. Just uh, being in that community constantly helps to kind of cover those blind spots. Absolutely. And then you mentioned in your sermon too how uh, one of the issues with Simon the Pharisee and with a lot of other people um, who just can't quite grasp the depth of their sin um, is pride, and a lot that pride can blind us um, to yeah. what's to to what's really going on um, in our lives and our hearts. And um, absolutely. And so, I guess the question would be: How is it that we can eventually get to the point where we can recognize the depths of our sin, where we can really? Um, what are some? You mentioned community, but what are some other ways that we can kind of cover those blind spots and really see uh, how sin is affecting our lives? Yeah. Well, I would say. You know, one of Jesus' first parables was of the soils, mm -hmm. you know, and they were representative of the souls of human beings. Right. And he says, the seed is the word of God. Mm -hmm. How are you going to get a crop? The only way you're going to get it is with seed, no seed, no crop. So right. you need the words of God mm -hmm. into a prepared soil, one that's soft and ready to receive it. Sure. And so like Simon, Simon knew the word of God, but right. his heart was resistant to change, mm -hmm. defensive, 
And so it just bounces off, right? Birds eat it, that's what Jesus said. But if I have a heart that understands my need, mm -hmm. that was what he was looking for, receptivity. Right. You know, mm -hmm. that's what he told the disciples later. Right. Um, so what I do is I, I come to the word of God knowing um, to understand the depths of my sin and need for grace, I can navel gaze and look at myself. I can do that. Or I can come to the word of God because when you see God for who he really is, it'll right size you. Right. But I know if I just come to the word of God, it can just be food for my arrogance. And so I have to come like the psalmist did and say, Lord, open my eyes that I might see wonderful things in your law. Right. He prayed that. What's the assumption there? The wonderful things are there. I have a seeing problem. Exactly. That's the humility of coming and going, God, I'm not going to see the beauties of your word. I'm going to see TV is more entertaining. I'm not going to see the depths of my soul. I'm going to see some other guys. I'm not as bad as that guy. So Lord, open my eyes and I see it. And then David in the same Psalm prayed, incline my heart to your testimonies. Mm -hmm. This is David, a man after heart, God's own heart saying, my heart is going to be inclined towards other things. And I know that about myself. So for me, as soon as I come to the word of God, I come confessing need. Mm -hmm. And you go, maybe I don't understand the depths of my sin. No, but that's something to confess. Right. Yeah, <laughs> like absolutely. David, God, open my eyes because I'm blind. Uh, incline my heart because it's not inclined. Yeah. And that's so horrible. It right. really is. But as you confess that and then come to his word, it's that, that soft soil right. with the word of God in it, that that's where uh, fruit can, can be born. And so I would say, you don't have to just sit and think about what a horrible person you sure. are. You meditate on God and, and your sin will, will rise. Right. He will point it out. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's kind of, again, going back to kind of combating that pride of uh, a lot of times we come yeah. to Scripture just assuming that we are inclined uh, or assuming yeah. that we understand our sins completely. Uh, and when that happens, uh, they're, yeah, our hearts are hardened at that we point. We don't even see how arrogant we are. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the final question we had, and it was a really good question, um, came in and said, um, how is it that uh, we can be forgiven at absolutely no cost of all of our multitude of sins? How is it that God can forgive us and that costs us nothing? How is that possible? Yeah. Well, I would say um, two things. One, it did cost a lot. Mm -hmm. And number two is you couldn't pay it. Right. I mean, that's... Yeah. Again, let's say in the same text, mm -hmm. two debtors unable to pay. Right. So God is looking at our sin and saying, you don't, you can't by your own energy come back from this. Mm -hmm. So I either let you go to hell right. or I step in. Mm -hmm. But his stepping in doesn't minimize sin. And that's the thing. Some people go, well, you just cheapen it. You say, like God goes, ah, it's all forgiven. You're like, God didn't just wave off sin. Right. Look at the cross. Mm -hmm. I remember I had a young man come to me that he said, you don't even know the horrors I've done. So you just tell me, oh, you're just forgiven. I said, no one's saying, oh, you're just forgiven. Right. I said, go back and read about Jesus's crucifixion. Mm. That's how much God hates sin, right. that it required the brutal death of Jesus mm -hmm. to pay for it. Mm. That was the payment. So does God take your sin lighter than you? No, right. he hates it much more than you. Mm. But you couldn't pay it. And so God in his love sacrificed his son for you. Right. And that's where when you understand how much it did cost yeah. uh, and that he was willing to pay it, right. those two things together, the understanding of my need and understanding of his grace, how can it be? It Absolutely. produces worship. It produces love. That's the point of this text. So it's yeah. a great question. Absolutely. And, uh, when you understand those things, it will change you. And then God is glorified by your transformed life. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. When we fully understand that, that's what leads us um, to look more like the woman um, in Luke 7 and less like Simon the Pharisee. Oh, yeah. Right. He changes you. And then you become a worshiper and a servant, mm -hmm. but it's all of grace. Right. You're not earning. You're celebrating. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Ben, thank you so much sure. for being here with that's us fun. today. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.